Hello, everyone. Hi, and welcome to Alta Live. My name is Beth Spotswood, and I am the digital editor of Alta Journal. I am so excited to welcome you here today to what is always one of our most popular topics at Alta Live and in Alta Journal, animals. Today, we are going to be talking about rattlesnakes. If you're anything like me, you probably have an opinion, as, as Emily was saying when we were chatting before going live. People have feelings about snakes one way or another. No one is ambivalent about snakes. I am joined today by Dr. Emily Taylor. You can read all about rattlesnakes in the current issue of Alta Journal, where Robert Ito wrote a fascinating look at what's going on in the world of rattlesnake science study right now. And so mentioned in that article is Emily, um, who's joining us today. Let me tell you a little bit about her. Emily Taylor is a professor of biological sciences at the California Polytechnic State University in San Luis Obispo, AKA Cal Poly, where she conducts research on the physiology, ecology, and conservation biology of lizards and snakes with her students. She's got a bachelor's from UC Berkeley, a PhD in biology from Arizona State, and she is self-described as obsessed with snakes. She is a staunch advocate for improving the public image of snakes, especially rattlesnakes. She founded a community science project called Project Rattlecam. I've been watching clips from it earlier this morning, where members of the public help her and other scientists learn about rattlesnakes by analyzing photos and live stream footage of snake dens. She also owns Central Coast Snake Services aimed at helping people and snakes in California coexist safely and peacefully. Her first book, California Snakes and How to Find Them, comes out next month. That's May 7th, and it's published by our friends at Heyday. So I am excited to welcome Dr. Emily Taylor today. Hi, Emily. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Um, before we dive into our snake chat, I do want to do my sales pitch. For Alta Journal, if you are unfamiliar with us, Alta is an award-winning quarterly magazine and website focused on California and the West. We are we are big and beautiful, as you can see. Here's the article about, look at this original artwork. Of it's snakes. so incredible. That art they did was incredible. Oh, I'm so glad you like it. Yeah. Um, so Alta, we, we're a quarterly magazine. So for 50 bucks a year, you get four gorgeous issues like this, a baseball cap, our guide to indie bookstores of California and the West, you can also join us for three bucks a month as a digital member. We have free events like this, Alta Live every Wednesday at 1230, the California Book Club. And if you're in the Bay Area, please join us tomorrow night at City Lights Bookstore in North Beach in San Francisco. We're going to have readings from this issue. Talk to our crossword creators. It'll be fantastic. Ty Tibble, the poet with the pullout in the current issue, will be there. So again, visit altaonline.com. Check us out. Speaking of altaonline.com, this interview will be posted there later this afternoon. You can also read Robert Ito's article on rattlesnakes. We're going to send you links to Emily's work where you can see the rattlesnake dens on the rattle cam and um, buy pre-order her book from Heyday. So stay tuned for your email um, later this afternoon for all of that info. And with that... Let us know in the chat where you're zooming in from. Emily, I am in Novato, California. Where are you today? Okay, fun fact. I went to Novato High School. Get out. I did for only two years before I moved away. Um, but I am, uh, I'm from my office right here in sunny San Luis Obispo, California. Oh, well, hi to Phoenix. Christine in Phoenix is joining us today. Um, thank you so much for coming today. I've got to ask the obvious question from the get-go. When did you fall for snakes? Why rattlesnakes? It was actually in college. So I wasn't one of those kids running around chasing snakes and, you know, you know catching, you know, worms and lizards and stuff. It was later and it was in a class called Natural History of the Vertebrates. It's a class that has um, got many a student interested in either herpetology or ornithology or mammalogy. And the moment was when um, my undergraduate professor, Harry Green, pulled a king snake out on a field trip from under like a rock or something and handed it to me. And that was it. And then when I started to, got to see rattlesnakes in the wild, I thought, what incredible animals. There was a little bit of the you know, fear factor because they're venomous. Um, they were really hard to find, which it, where we were, which made it, you know, the challenge. And then as I learned about them, I just realized how incredible they were. And I wanted just to learn more. And so the, I, let's talk about the fear factor, because it is the first thing that comes to mind when we think of rattlesnakes. Um, I'm, why is it, why have you, 
tell us kind of what you what research have you done because I know you've you've been following rattlesnakes studying them for 25 years um what have you learned debunk some of those myths oh my gosh um yeah sure of course oh my gosh how much time do we have <laughs> no I'm just kidding um so people who've who've seen rattlesnakes in the wild and worked with rattlesnakes realize that they're actually nothing like what you see on tv so when we watch a show on animal planet or a, a youtube recording or some, people are are oftentimes provoking those snakes because um fear sells right watching a, a rattlesnake that's rearing up and that is rattling its rattle and maybe lunging at the camera those are the kind of things people seem to want to see although actually have a bone to pick with that. I think that there's a lot of people out there who want to see rattlesnakes being rattlesnakes because it's even even cooler than that. And so those things make people afraid of rattlesnakes. But when you're actually out there studying them, especially like I have used radio telemetry to study rattlesnakes in the field for many years, where we put radio transmitters in them, follow them around. So I get to know their personalities. And each one is unique. Um, some of them are really mellow and gentle. And some of them, you know, maybe have a more of an attitude, but they want nothing to do with us. They just want to go about living their lives and eating their rodents and not being bothered by us. And I think one of the um, most impactful things that I ever heard was uh, actually by a young student in an outreach um, event that my colleagues were doing, which they said they were watching a rattlesnake rattle and they said, yeah, that, that rattlesnake is rattling. It's not a sound of ferociousness. That's the rattlesnake screaming. And I thought that was really amazing because it really showed that those rattlesnakes are scared when they're doing that, they're not being aggressive. Isn't that amazing? So yeah. Is it the rattlesnake screaming or do they scream? They, they don't, I mean, that's basically how they scream. They can't make noises with their mouth. So that's a rattlesnake rattling is saying, I'm scared of you and I'm warning you to get away from me because if I have to, uh, I will use my venom to defend myself. But rattlesnakes don't wanna do that. They want them to use their venom for their prey. So they really get a bad rap and it's not fair. And they're incredible animals that do a lot for us, you know, ecologically, and they just want to be left alone. What do they do for us ecologically? Why, why should we cherish, rehome, et cetera, save the rattlesnake? It's a few reasons, and some of them are not unique to rattlesnakes. You could say that they were the case for really any big snakes. Um, that would be things like eating a lot of rodents, which um, rodents have a right to exist as well, but we want to keep balance in the ecosystem. And so uh, rattlesnakes and other snakes help keep rodent populations where they should be. Otherwise, if we have these huge bursts in, in rodent populations, they could be eating our crops, eating native plants, and generally wreaking havoc on that delicate balance in the food web. Um, and it also, a lot of those rodents carry, um, you know, vectors of diseases that could be impactful to humans like Lyme disease, hantavirus. Here in California, we have plague that's carried by the California ground squirrels. So these, these predatory snakes do a really important job keeping those at the appropriate levels. And then the third thing that's really important about rattlesnakes uniquely is that their venom is now a major inspiration for drug development. So if anyone out there who's listening has a family member or a friend who has been treated for um, heart disease, uh, specifically had a stent put in for a heart attack or maybe has a has at risk for heart or blood clots that could lead to a heart attack, they may very well be getting a drug that is actually literally rattlesnake venom. Uh, really? And there's, mm -hmm, yeah, and because rattlesnake venoms have anticoagulants in them that cause the prey to bleed to death. And so if we harness the power of that in a pharmaceutical lab, we can use that to help uh, lower the risk of blood clots. And that's just the beginning. There's lots of snake venoms that are, you know, being developed for uh, treating cancer, et cetera. And we've now reached a tipping point in the United States um, where snake venoms are saving far more lives than they're taking. Whoa, how many, I know this is mentioned in the article, but for, for the folks that haven't had a chance to read it yet, how many people, humans, are bitten by rattlesnakes in California every year? And how many of those people die from it? You know, in California, it's just a few hundred. Excuse me. I have a little bit of a cold. Emily oh. warned us that this might happen. She's going to cough. A little bit of cold. Don't worry. It's not venomous. <laughs> uh, in California, it's a few hundred every year. In the United States, it's about 5,000. Only about five deaths. Really? So if I, while you're coughing, I'm going to ask my question. So if I get bit by a rattlesnake, and after I ask this question and Emily answers it, we're going to look at some pictures of rattlesnakes. And Emily is going to take us through kind of what we're looking at. Tell us. Take all the time you need, Emily. You, it is going around. We've all had it this winter. 
You got this. All right. So if I get bit by a rattlesnake, I'm walking out on Tennessee Valley Road or wherever I am up here. And I make the mistake of upsetting a rattlesnake, alerting, making it anxious. And um, it bites me. What do I do? And what's going to happen to me um, so that I'm not one of those five people that die from it every year? So the only thing people should do is go straight to the hospital. Call 911, go straight to the hospital. No tourniquets, no cutting and sucking, none of those types of things. Oh, no sucking like in City Slickers? Yeah, no. it's only ever been in the movies. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at some snakes because they look so cool. Um, what are we looking at here? These beautiful photos by uh, Marissa Ishimatsu. She took a lot of the photos from my, uh, my book that's coming out. And that is a Coast Mountain King snake, which isn't it beautiful? It is a harmless snake in California, much beloved by people who like to go out looking for snakes. Wait, this snake is harmless? I thought things, I thought like creatures that had red were supposed, that's the, the color, the bright color is supposed to be a warning. Not in this case. Not in this case. Um, this may be a mimic of a deadly snake called a coral snake that doesn't occur in California, occurs like over in Arizona. There's a lot of research on that, but the idea is that maybe a hawk that sees it is like, oh, I'm not going to eat that because that might be poisonous, but completely harmless and absolutely beautiful, huh? Totally gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. Looks terrifying. I'm sorry. I know we're learning about snakes today, but it really, I would stay far away from this. Who is this? Look at that eye. Unbelievable snake, huh? That's a Southwestern speckled rattlesnake. And they are famous for kind of coming in all colors of the rainbow. They're rock dwellers. So they oftentimes blend in with the color of the rocks around them. And it's not like that they're, you know, changing color to blend in, but rather by natural selection over the past, you know, many millions of years, the ones that were the same color as the rocks were camouflaged and were more likely to survive because the predators couldn't see them. So you have black ones, orange ones, blue ones, pink ones. They're just stunning. Is this snake missing? Like, does it have an injury right under its nose? What is that? It's um, like missing a scale. Under its nose, you mean? What do you, yeah. You mean like where 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 the tongue is or above the tongue? Yeah, or what, like what there's like a hole in its face. Am I? Oh, the pits. I see what you're talking about. Yeah, what yeah, is that? So rattlesnakes are pit vipers. Um, They have underneath their nostrils, they have these two holes on the side and they can actually sense uh, infrared radiation. So for example, if it was completely pitch black out and they couldn't use their eyes to see a rodent running by, they would be able to actually sense the heat coming off of that warm blooded prey and successfully be able to strike and eat that prey. The pits. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, is this a den? Are we looking at a rattlesnake in a den? And can you it's tell us about dens? Where do they live? Yeah, that certainly could be. So this is a Northern Pacific rattlesnake basking in a, this is very much what you might see this time of year as snakes are starting to emerge. So rattlesnakes will in some parts of California and the rest of the country and the rest of the Western hemisphere, they will overwinter together in these rocky outcrops and that's a den. And then they'll come out and bask in the spring before they all kind of go their separate ways during the summer. And are they, in terms of throughout winter, do they hibernate? Are they, they all like hang out in the den and then in spring they emerge? Is now when I need to start being more aware on the trails? Yeah, definitely. I mean, snake season, you know, technically could be any time of the year, including in the winter, especially in mild areas on the coast, that the snakes aren't as active. They may be above ground on the coast where it doesn't freeze, less likely to see them. Certainly in April and especially in May in all of California, that's where the snakes really start to come out. And all they're going to everywhere. May is peak. And, you know, in some places that are particularly cold, like higher in the Sierra Nevada, you might start to see that peak in, in um, activity being a little bit later in the summer. So whenever it's really starts to get nice and warm is when the rattlesnakes come out. Um, perfect timing for your book. May 7th again, folks. That's right. That's right. All right, here we have a rattler. Oh, this is the perfect time. So I, I told my um, five-year-old son that I was going to interview a rattlesnake expert today. And he has a question, which I think is a great question. What is the rattle made out of? This is a wonderful question. 
And it is made of the same thing that your fingernails are made of, a protein called keratin, and it's just as breakable. So most rattlesnakes don't have a complete rattle. It'll break off over time, just like most people, thank goodness, don't have complete fingernails their whole lives. Um, does it, is there something inside? Is it like a rattle? Is there something that shakes inside those little kernels? No, that's actually not how it works. So each segment that you see, you're only seeing part of it on the inside. It actually kind of subdivides and loosely interlocks with the ones beyond it so that you have a chain of loosely interlocking segments. So when the rattlesnake shakes its tail, they all bang against each other. Yeah. If it, if it comes off, like a nail comes off, do they grow? This is a very dumb question. Forgive me. I'm spitballing here. Do they grow back like a lizard's tail or is it gone forever? It's gone forever. However, eat, rattlesnakes uh, make a new segment every time they shed. So the ones that you're seeing on that rattlesnake that's closer to the base of its tail are newer than the ones that are further out. So new ones are made and it pushes the older ones further back along. So if they break off their entire rattle, then they'll just start making new ones. There are some rattlesnakes though, for example, if their tail got run over when they were babies, that type of thing, that they have a stubby little tail and they're not able to keep making any rattles. So they actually are rattleless rattlesnakes occasionally. And there's there's an island in Mexico where all the rattlesnake species, all the members of the species that live there have no rattles and that's genetic. Wow, and yet they're still rattlesnakes. They're still rattlesnakes because everything else about them is a rattlesnake. They just have lost their rattle secondarily. Other than the rattle, what, what makes a, how is a rattlesnake different from another snake or, you know, the venom? Yeah. I mean, there's many things. There's the, um, the venom that it, that it makes and then, you know, the rattle are those the things that most people think about, but there's a lot of other really interesting things that rattlesnakes have that not all other snakes have. Um, they might not be as visible to us. So one thing that was discovered pretty recently that I think is super cool is that the structure of the snake scales is modified so that the, if it, uh, rains, the rainwater like beads up on the snake's back instead of rolling right off. And that allows the rattlesnakes to drink off of their backs. And as we have discovered by watching them at communal dens and rookeries, which is a place where pregnant rattlesnakes stay together in the summer, they also drink off of each other, which is pretty amazing. Um, You talk, oh, here's, a, here's another rattlesnake. It looks pretty camouflaged. As you were saying before, can you tell us a little bit more? I just think because we'll all find it reassuring. Rattlesnakes want nothing to do with us, but they do like, they do, you've learned through your research that they are pretty social with each other. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Rattlesnakes are, um, you know, want to stay as far away from us as possible. This sidewinder rattlesnake right here is showing the rattlesnake's first line of defense, which is camouflage. They're only going to break that camouflage and rattle at us if they feel like they've been discovered. And they're only going to strike if they feel like they have to. Incidentally, they don't necessarily go in that order. They don't always rattle before they strike. Um, but oh, really? this is, you you might no, the water. no, there's no rules when it comes to rattlesnakes, never. Um, but except for that the rule is they don't want to bite you. <laughs> they just will do it if they have to. Um, so this sidewinder is a solitary animal right now. And that's how many rattlesnake species are throughout their most of their lives. They only get together for mating. Maybe some species might get together for the communal dens in the winter, not all species. But we're now learning that some species and some populations are a lot more social than we thought. So, for example, in um, this high elevation den of prairie rattlesnakes that we study in Colorado, they get together and spend the winter and then they come out and bask in these giant piles in the spring all the males and the females who are not pregnant leave for the summer and they go out and they hunt you know, for critters while the pregnant females stay behind. And they show a lot of really fascinating social behavior. So that's one of the things that we're studying with Project Rattlecam, where people can watch at rattlecam.org starting in early May. It's very exciting. Um, you can watch live on YouTube and ask us questions. Um, we're relying on people out there to help us watch and to document some of these social behaviors. Because the problem with studying social behavior is when you walk up to rattlesnakes, they get super scared. And so they don't start, they don't, they don't act natural. Those social behaviors are broken. But by putting these cameras on them, we're able to watch them when they don't know they're being watched. <laughs> and so we're gonna be able to learn about these in detail for, um, you know, to really build on what we know. Folks, we will send you a link to the rattlesnake cam. Um, this I grabbed from your Twitter, Emily. Can you tell us what's going on here? 
Yeah, this was uh, last week. I went down and I did a snake safety training course for the four groundskeepers here that you can see from the San Joaquin National Cemetery, which um, anyone who's not from the area, that is a uh, veterans uh, cemetery and a VA a Veterans Administration land where many of our fallen heroes are uh, interred. And this is up in the hills in the Central Valley. And everyone who, who's been there knows that where the hills meet the Central Valley in California is a place where there's a lot of rattlesnakes. And so the rattlesnakes sometimes venture down into the cemetery grounds. Um, and a lot of families are visiting a, a lot to pay respects to their um, deceased uh, fit, uh, fit, uh, veterans. And it could be dangerous for, for the people and for rattlesnakes to interact. And so I trained these guys on how to successfully and safely relocate rattlesnakes back up into the hills about a quarter mile away so that they can um, live peacefully with them. I would say that you know, in many places around the country and indeed around the whole Western hemisphere, the standard thing is to kill the rattlesnake. But as people have learned more and more and more about how important these animals are and how they have these really complex social lives where the moms even take care of the babies for at least a couple of weeks, people really don't want to kill them anymore. And so when they have this safety training so that they know what to do and how to do right by the snake, then it's a win-win for everybody involved. How did these groundskeepers react to the task of relocating a rattlesnake? These were, this was a really good group. I train people all over California from all different kinds of groups, everything from, you know, construction workers doing so at solar farms, uh, military personnel, biologists. And so I have lots of different types of attitudes about snakes. And these guys were into it. I think they, they want to be safe when they work. I mean, that's first and foremost, right? I mean, you, if you're interacting with rattlesnakes, you want to be safe. And I, I'm going to be frank with you, killing rattlesnakes can be really dangerous. So I taught them how to relocate the snake in a very safe way. I will also say that um, even though these are civilians, people associated with military areas, they have a really strong natural resources and wildlife ethos. I mean, military bases and also places like this, um, which is run by the VA, people who work there, they know that this, this is a, a resource for, for everyone, including the wildlife, and we need to take care of that wildlife. So I really respect that. Um, all right, we've got a million audience questions. Um, I want to I want to grab some from folks. Um, we got questions online. We have questions um, here in the chat and in the the Q and A button. All right, so um, we've got one. Let's see. Um, Darlene asks, how far do rattlesnakes travel from their dens when they emerge in the spring, and do they follow those same routes every year? Do, are there rattlesnake paths? That's an awesome question. So it totally depends on the species and their sex. So males tend to travel a little further than females. Uh, but I can give you a couple of like examples. Um, here where I live in San Luis, San Luis Obispo, California, the snakes come up in the spring and they don't travel very far from where they spent the winter. So their whole home range, the whole area they spend the whole year might just be the size of like one or two football fields, really small area. Sometimes the males might sneak out of there to look for females in May, but they always come back to that same area. Um, in contrast, in Colorado, where we study the prairie rattlesnakes, we've got, you know, a couple thousand snakes on this peak of this hill in the winter, and then most of them just disperse, and they can go for miles. They can go for, like, up two miles away, and they all spread out to find their hunting grounds. And, yes, it typically what we see is that year after year, individual snakes will go back to the same places. Not always, but usually they do. And if they have a home. They have, it's like their apartment. They know where they're going. All right. We have gotten a ton of questions about email live now about, is it true that baby rattlesnakes? No. Are, you know what I I'm say, Is say? it true? I say no. <laughs> are baby young child juvenile rattlesnakes are more venomous or more dangerous than adults because they don't know how to regulate the amount of venom that comes out of their fangs. It's not true. It's the biggest myth about rattlesnakes. Uh, most things you've heard about rattlesnakes are myths, and this is probably the biggest one. Um, baby rattlesnakes, just like adults, can control how much venom they inject. And the truth is that they just inject less venom than adults on, on average. So if you look at the actual data, which is the relationship between snake size and the severity of the bite, the bigger the snake, the more severe the bite. So this is not true. It's a myth. There you go. Um, Tasha asks, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Emily said no tourniquets, no second, called 911 and head immediately to the hospital if you get bitten by a rattlesnake. 
what do you do if you're on a one hour hike or there's a two hour return hike, et cetera? Um, do you have suggestions um, for what to do then? And and do you, would you consider a snake venom extractor kit? So first of all, the kits are terrible as well. They don't work and they just cause more, cause most inf more inflammation in the area of the bite. So nothing, like literally nothing. The only thing you'd want to do is take off any rings or constrictive jewelry and then get to the hospital. So to answer your question about if you're in a really remote area, um, it's tricky because it depends on how far you are and whether you have cell phone signal. If you have a cell phone signal, you can call 911. What you want to do is make sure they know who you are and get someone to orchestrate a rescue operation where they can come get you, whether it's um, you know, a trail crew coming up there to get you. You could start to slowly walk back towards the trailhead, but sometimes with a severe snake bite, you may not be able to, or you may start making bad decisions because you kind of become overcome by the snake bite. So it's if you're really far, uh, it can cause people to become really out of it and woozy. People have like walked off the trail and, you know, walked the opposite direction and gotten very confused. So um, the pain can be overcome people. People can get really sick. They can start vomiting. And you know how when you start feeling really sick, you start to just lose your sense of where you are. So most people say that call for help and then follow their directions, but try to stay put. The other thing that's really important is if you're far enough away, they'll send a medevac helicopter, which is key because you want to get to treatment as quick as possible. It's not like on TV when someone gets bit by a rattlesnake and like staggers two steps and drops dead. Um, it's a much longer process usually where people are, you know, having a terrible swelling and, but the, What's happening though is that the venom is, you know, eat, starting to eat away inside at the body and starting to cause problems with with blood coagulation, and so getting the anti venom as quickly as possible is going to reverse those. So hospital as quick as possible. I will tell you all that um, something that's new in most of your iPhones and other phones that you might have is it has a built in SOS signal. So even if you're in a place where you don't have cell signal, you usually can call for help with an SOS. So if you do spend time in the back in the back backwoods, back trails, back roads, learn how to use that SOS so that you could use that if needed. Wow, you'd how long do you have ballpark? There really isn't a ballpark. I mean, people hate that. It's like my scientist type question. It's because it just varies so much. It varies based on how much venom is injected, a person's own health, so many different things that um Really, the truth is that back, you know, hundreds of years ago when people would typically, with the, you know, there was a lot higher death rate from rattlesnakes because there was no antivenom. Most of those deaths were, unfortunately, long, drawn out deaths over several days. Um, it's not happening right away. That said, there are some rattlesnake venoms that have neurotoxins. There are some people who will get a really, you know, get lots of venom and their physiology will react poorly to that. And it could be more in a matter of hours. But what the data typically show is that if you get to treatment within a few hours, you're going to be on the road to recovery. I'm being wishy-washy because there's no rules. It really just depends on the severity of the bite. Um. All right. How we have so many questions, Emily. I'm just gonna I'm gonna grab a few more. How has climate change affected rattlesnakes and other large snakes? So there's only been a little bit of research on this. It's uh kind of hard to do um, because it involves repeated sampling of rattlesnakes in the same areas over time, and it's really hard to be able to tease out the effects of climate change and other things that might be happening, um, like habitat destruction, which is clearly the biggest risk to rattlesnakes and most other wildlife. Uh, but my uh, my graduate student, Haley Crowell, did do a, a project a few years ago on California rattlesnakes and showed that climate change is projected to actually benefit rattlesnakes here in California. And that's the basically, and this is you know simplistic, it's based on the temperatures only so the idea is that rattlesnakes want to be at a higher temperature. When you put them in a gradient, they choose higher temperatures. And so if it's higher temperatures available to them for more of the year, then they're gonna be out more. They're gonna have a shorter hibernation period. They're gonna be hunting more, more opportunity to you know, eat food and have more babies and that type of thing. Um, it's complicated, right? And also that certainly wouldn't apply to rattlesnakes in Phoenix that might be living at the you know peak, at the like top end of their thermal um, niche right now because it's so hot there already. So I think it's going to be really complicated how it um, affects rattlesnakes, but it's not going to be negative to them in places that are mild. The rattlesnakes are probably going to do pretty well with climate change. Um, I wonder how often you get this question. Amy and San Rafael asks, how do snakes mate? Oh, this is my favorite question. Okay, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell a super quick story about this first. I once told this, this coming story about how rattlesnakes mate to a, I was giving a presentation to a group called um, 
with slow ra uh, ra rams. It was retired active men. And so these men were, you know, in their 80s and 90s. And, and it was at seven in the morning. And I was up there. And it was incredible. I just started to talk about snake penises. And it was so funny. It was on Valentine's Day. So it was perfect. <laughs> but rattlesnakes have two penises. In fact, uh, all, all snakes and lizards have two penises. And in rattlesnakes, they're tucked away inside the male's tail. And it will fill up with blood and come out. And it's this big, each, each uh, penis has kind of two big lobes and they're all spiky looking. And as that fills up with blood, it is inserted into the female's cloaca. So all, all rattlesnakes have just, just one hole and they'll become locked together. And they'll kind of stay locked together as there's a slow transfer of semen. Sometimes it takes many, many, many hours. And I've, uh, once in Arizona, I was walking down the wash and I saw a really long rattlesnake, like across the whole wash. I'm like, rattlesnakes don't get that long in Arizona. And I walked up and I realized that it was actually two rattlesnakes they were hooked up still mating, but the female had gotten tired of it and just took off and she's dragging the male behind her. So her head's this way, his head's that way, and they're just dragging them along. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Wait, if they have two penises, which penis do they use for sex? They alternate. Whoa. If anyone watched Curb Your Enthusiasm last week, there is a joke about that in there. Um, okay, two questions um, about preventing or, or alerting rattlesnakes to one's presence. Same question. Is it, do, should we tap the ground with a walking stick or stomp as we're walking along? That's really tricky because if you do that, it might be good for you because the rattlesnake might tell you it's there because it rattles, but it also can alert the rattlesnake and it can make it more likely to strike if you accidentally do step on it. So I always say it's context dependent. If you're out on a trail hiking and you're wearing hiking boots, um, by the way, Please invest in hiking boots that don't have those breathable mesh panels because those are like butter. Snake fang will go right through those. Have nice, thick, solid leather boots. Um, if you're doing that, you should be fine. Just keep your wits about you and watch yourself and don't step on a snake. But if you're working in tall grass, you should just have protection that goes all the way up to your knees anyway. So that can be, you know, snake boots or it can be a good set of boots with snake gaiters, which are things that wrap around your lower leg. In other words, banging around like that is a little bit more something that wouldn't necessarily work. It's tricky. And so the only time I would recommend doing it is if you have like um, a pile of wood that you have to clean up and you're worried there could be snakes under it. Then you might bang around to see that before you start going and cleaning up that pile of wood. Um, but if you're, if you're just walking through an area, just keep yourself protected instead. All right, fair enough. Um, Lisa asks about rattlesnake combat, and there's actually a video of, of, on your channel, um, from the, from the den cam, um, of these two, like, male rattlesnakes all wrapped up in each other and then fighting. Can you tell us about rattlesnake combat? Yeah, it's one of the coolest things to see. If any, if any of the viewers here have ever gotten to see it, oh, you're so lucky. It's so cool. That's why we were so excited when we started to watch it live as our snakes were doing it in front of the den. So male rattlesnakes, um, you know, they can't arm wrestle, they can't beat each other up, so they body wrestle, and it's called a ritualized male combat. They don't bite each other, they just wrestle, and they'll rear up and kind of try to pin each other down. Um, you can tell the males from the females, the males are much bigger than the females, and so if you ever see a, a rattlesnake that's like three feet long, it's usually a male, um, females are more dainty. Um, anyway. And uh, oftentimes the male that gets pinned to the ground is going to kind of go away and sulk for a while. And the bigger male might go and be able to mate with the female that's there if she'll have him. So combat is really, really, really cool. Um, a recent paper showed that in some venomous snakes, the combat might also be over a food resource. But I've never seen that happen. For rattlesnakes, for the most part, it's usually a female nearby that they're fighting for. Um, last couple of questions for you, Emily. In, in your 25 years... Plus of studying snakes, specifically rattlesnakes, have you ever been bitten? I was bitten when I was a graduate student in my first year. It was the year 2000. So we're 24 years out now. And uh, I was tubing a rattlesnake, which is a technique where you cause, you stimulate a rattlesnake to crawl up into a clear plastic tube so that you can then hold it by the mid body and its head is caught up in the tube. And so that way we can get like a blood sample from its tail. And I was doing that, you know, all day, every day for all week basically to sample the, my lab colony of snakes and I made a mistake and I got bit in my hand and it wasn't a severe bite I mean all rattlesnake bites are severe bite but I was lucky in the sense that it wasn't disfiguring I was able to get to the hospital right away 
but I think that's part of what inspired me to do snake safety training courses. Now, everything that I do is like that much more safe and then even more safe because I've experienced what it's like to slip up. Wow. Didn't see that one coming. Um, do you have, I know you have a lot of pets. Do you happen to have a rattlesnake? Well, I have three rattlesnakes. I'm, I'm a little dain to call them pets because they are, you know, working animals. They work for their, their mice. I use them in outreach and also in snake safety training courses. Um, I have two Northern Pacific rattlesnakes and a Southern Pacific rattlesnake. Um, but then for pets really it's mainly my dog, my bearded dragon and our rescue boa constrictor baby. Do, can people have rattlesnakes as pets? Is that advisable? Well, you can. So it's legal, whether it's advisable or not. I think it really just depends on the person. There's a lot of people who do have rattlesnakes as pets. And I just think it's a matter of being a responsible pet owner and being able to be safe and also be able to tr treat the snake right, just like it would be for anything else. I'll tell you, they're a lot easier to keep and keep healthy than bearded dragons are. So if people... If people are willing to, you know, not showboat them and not do something that I call free handling, which is um, picking up your rattlesnake, even if the rattlesnake has a good attitude, picking it up, you never know when that's going to change. Um, if people are willing to not do that, then yeah, sure, why not? Why not? You've got five hours from. I yeah, I, I, sh I should say that uh, that that's in California. It, it is legal to have California rattlesnakes, not not from outside the state, and then state laws vary outside of California. All right. So for anyone considering following this talk, rethinking, reconsidering, rebranding the rattlesnake, if you want to get one, make sure you're in California. It's only, and can you buy it or do you have to like catch it? You can't buy it. And California prohibits the sale of native reptiles. There are some like weird loopholes on that, but for the most part, you catch it yourself. I mean, again, unless you have a really good reason to have one, I wouldn't recommend it. There's a lot better pets, pet snakes, species that you can have. Um, but, but you asked, <laughs> it is I legal. Know, I, asked, I asked, I asked about the mating too. Um, all right, Dr. Emily Taylor, you are the coolest. I want to take your snake class. This has been so much fun speaking with you. We're still getting a million questions and I encourage you all to check out. We're going to send you links to, um, Emily's website, where you can read Robert Ito's article in Alta and where you can pre-order her book that's coming out May 7th. Again, it's called California Snakes and How to Find Them, not how to avoid them, how to find them. And that's by Heyday Books. So we're going to send you links to all of that. Um, again, folks, I want to invite you tomorrow night, City Lights Bookstore in San Francisco at 7 p.m. We're having a super fun party. Um, we'll be at the LA Times Festival of Books. We're having an event on for Indie Bookstore Day at Pages in LA. And I invite you to join us next week at Alta Live, where we're going to talk about Pioneer Town in the Mojave Desert. Um, and with that, Emily Taylor, Rattlesnake Genius, thank you so very much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Nice to chat with everyone. All right. Take care, everyone. See ya.